Hello, everyone. This is Michael Tierra of the East West School of Herbal Medicine, Planetary Herbology specifically. And it's my pleasure to uh, have a discussion with one of my favorite students of all time. And now I could be his, his student. <laughs> Uh, that's that's the way that's the way it is in this world. We learn from each other all the time, and uh, and uh, but Thomas is a particularly uh, Thomas Guerin has been studying plant medicine for over thirty years. Sixteen of those years, I believe, was in China, right, Thomas? I've been here for just uh, yeah, sixteen years now. He's a uh, traditional uh, Chinese medical doctor, and he's also a PhD in Materia Medica Studies and Plant Pharmacy at the Chinese, Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences in Beijing. This should be of great interest to those of you who are interested in cultivating uh, Chinese herbs and, and or any herbs for that matter. He's, he's got a brilliant book. You want to show your book on, one more time, Thomas? Uh, yeah, it's here. Chinese Herb Cultivation. Right. It's a must because I don't think there's any other book like that in the United States at this time. And, and Thomas is uh, probably... Uh, uh, the sole uh, bringer of the, the art of the art of Chinese medical con cultivation and uh, and Dowdy herbs, which is going to be a, a question that we're going to find out. What is Dowdy momentarily? He's the first non-Chinese recipient of the PhD from the Beijing National Center for Materia Medica Resources. He has a master's degree in traditional oriental medicine and a certificate in herbal medicine from the American School of Herbalism. This is a school that uh, Christopher Hobbs and myself and Paul Lee several years ago formed here on, on site school teaching herbal medicine. And Thomas. Several and years ago? <laughs> several years ago? <laughs> many, many years. God. <laughs> 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 And the loose definition of several, I think. <laughs> he's the author of two books on Western herbs and Chinese medicine, which uh, which caught my eye because that that's, has been one of my big focuses in, in, in my career uh, in herbal medicine. And Thomas picked up that bandwagon and developed it much further. And I uh, am very, very appreciative of him as, for having done that. And... Uh, Let's see, the first men's health book is to be published. It was written in, in the 17th century, the first men's health book on Chinese medicine, which is going to be forthcoming. He's also the co-translator of a free of a free ebook on the initial response to the COVID out, outbreak. Uh, China, um, uh, Thomas was, was there when it all happened over the last few years and saw it from beginning to the present, I guess, is still going on there quite, a, quite heavily, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, it is. So, um, Thomas, um, the question of Dao Di is something that is very unfamiliar in in, in this in this country because uh, we just buy herbs that basically are brought here, and and uh, and I know that Chinese medical doctors will specifically ask for a specific herb grown in a different province in China. And these command different prices. So, can you tell us a little bit about what what Dao Di is? So, um, Dao Di is a concept that's been present in the literature for about two thousand years. the The term itself is only since the Ming Dynasty, so about mm, five six hundred years. Um, and and you're correct in saying that um, sometimes doctors will say, or or you know, on their prescriptions they'll specifically uh, use a. a a specific name for an herb which suggests that it should come from this particular region in, in whatever province. Um, and, that, and that's pretty actually, you know, not, uh, you know, there's some herbs that we know actually, uh, even in the West, like um, Hui Niu Si. Hui Niu Si is uh, uh, um, Acrianthus. Oh, yeah. Right? That first, that first character, Hui, actually is uh, denotes a specific place that it comes from. Really? So there's, there's actually quite a lot of herbs that have that name that we just don't recognize because we don't know the, you know, the history of the character, what that means. We just see the pinyin. 
Unless I'm mistaken, I have it growing as a weed in my garden. Yeah, it's 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 weedy for sure. Um, <laughs> Very important herb, though. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so um, you know the the concept has been. Um, well, just to back up just a little bit into like the mid twentieth century. Um, prior to that, uh, and even until the eighties, about uh, eighty percent of all Chinese herbs were coming from the wild. But in the fifties, uh, they realized that they needed to start with some major cultivation efforts because they were unable to satisfy the needs. Wow, I and so. It was really the first time that, uh, for the most part, herbs were cultivated. I mean, there's there's some herbs, for example, uh, Tanggui was has you know about a thousand years history of cultivation, and um, yeah, so Angelica sinensis. Yeah, when well, you were here in the United States, we talked about Tanggui, and 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 you said no no place in the United States that you visited did anybody really have Tanggui here. So no, I've never seen the. I, the true species no not in this I, I, maybe it exists but i have i've been to several places and they say this is dangui and i look at it and it's not dangui yeah i bought several plants that i thought was dangui and wasn't i'm no. sorry to interrupt you go ahead no no it's okay it's okay so anyway so um starting in the 50s uh, these major cultivation efforts began and um you know not having grown these herbs before like a anybody who knows anything about growing plants, if you take something out of the wild and you bring it into a, a farming or even a garden situation, it's not always very simple. Sometimes it's easy, you know, if it's kind of a weedy thing, maybe like nettles, yeah. you basically plant it and it grows. But for a lot of these species, it wasn't easy and they ran into a lot of problems. They, you know, very difficult for some of them. Right. And so they started, you know, looking in the research to try to understand uh, better, uh, you know, what were the standards that were used for choosing uh, the best herbs? And um, Tao Di was, you know, obviously one of the more important ones. So that that sort of uh, gave birth to further study, you know, in part. There was other other factors involved, but this was a big part of it um, to to this concept. And so today, um, it's been developed to the point where it's used a lot in marketing, you know, so for example, uh, you know, most, or yeah, I think a, a lot of Chinese people, I'm not sure if most, but certainly a lot, a large percentage of Chinese people, just regular people who don't know anything about Chinese medicine per se, understand this term, or have heard the term at least, maybe they don't fully understand it, but they've heard the term and they know that the herbs are considered the best herbs right mm. and so um this is something like um if you think about um champagne right? right champagne can only be called champagne if it's grown in a particular region in france mm. right? right and i'm sorry I, I forget that the term for that I, it's somehow escaped my my mind at the moment but anyway um so, champagne. <laughs> yeah. but anyway it's, it's basically like that so so there's been a lot of research um, uh, we look at, uh, you know, growing conditions and, uh, and then try to assess the, the, um, the chemistry of the plants, um, because the, um, the reality is, is not everybody, historically, everybody has agreed that, you know, this is the region that is, that is the Tao Di region. You know, some authors say that's the region or that, the other place is the region. And, you know, it's not clear why one would choose one region over another and maybe their experience and maybe relationships they had with people where they got the herbs you know who knows um and uh, since our our best tool of evaluating the quality of herbs at this point other than talking to doctors in their clinical experience is to uh, look at the chemistry of the, the herbs right. And, uh, and I might ask you or add to this in the sense that that uh, the idea that one that there's such a thing as phytochemistry, where you could actually analyze and see uh, the various the compounds that plants contain, and uh, and then hopefully uh, identify the active chemistry. That that was that was historically not really known until very recently, and. Uh, 
So the, the my my uh, my assumption here is that the the closest we got to understanding the, for the, the, the more ancient people had to understanding chemistry was in the flavors, and the and the flavors uh, t- tended to represent chemical compounds as as much as it could, as they could be understood in earlier times. Am I correct in think in that assumption? Sure, I think I think I think that's largely true. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, as the chemistry changes in a plant, so with the flavor. Exactly. So, you know, something that is normally uh, that we might consider very bitter, um, you know, if it doesn't have those compounds in it, whatever it is that's making it bitter, right. you know, because it's grown in a place where, you know, it's not challenged or it doesn't have the right environment to produce those compounds and it will be less bitter. Right. And so, you know, uh, just like a, someone who's trained at, at um, uh, sipping wine and discerning different uh, qualities in wine, flavors and regions and so on and so forth. The same is true for uh, highly qualified people in the herb trade. So people can look at it, they can feel it, touch it, break it, they can taste it. Right. Uh, and these are all the things that, uh, you know, a well trained person can tell you uh, a lot about the quality of an herb without ever looking at it under uh you know, under the conditions to, to check on the chemistry. And you know, when I first started, that's that, that's all we had to go by when, in my, in, in, in my uh, herbal journey. Sure, sure. So that's called organoleptics. And, um, you know, those of us who are trained to do that uh, can, can tell a lot about, about the quality of an herb. Right. Um, so, and it's still, it's still extremely important in the market um, and, and some people would say it's still the most important because it's, uh, you know, it takes a trained person and you can, you can go somewhere and, and very quickly assess the quality of an herb. Um, whereas, you know, doing any kind of chemistry takes some time, you know, you have to take that to a lab, you have to do, you have to extract, and then you have to put it into a machine and blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, that takes time. And these flavors, uh, even without knowing chemistry, just the actual taste of bitter or sweet or sour, we have an immediate physiological reaction that we can feel in our mouth, which I think is still a, is still valid uh, in terms of understanding what, what a plant is doing to uh, operating. Uh, that's my that's my uh, my understanding. I've, I, I've had to make all this up. I never studied like you did to actually get to get to this, but I but I it's just through my own work with plants that I, that I came to that understanding. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with you for sure. I mean, um, when it comes to, uh, I mean, the, the, the flavors, as we understand them in Chinese medicine, kind of, I mean, we're, we've sort of moved away from Tao Di now and more into, uh, you know. Well, Tao Di is what, what is making the, chemi- the, chem- the plant chemistry and consequently making the flavors, I would think. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, they're certainly related. I'm not going to say they're not related. Um, I think, uh, you know, perhaps we can uh, uh, couch the flavors uh, uh, um, discussion for a moment and sure. just kind of follow through with the rest of the Dao Di and then, and then come back to this when we talk more, because we're going to talk sure. more about, uh, you know, Western herbs and Chinese medicine. So... Right. Um, so let's look at, um, you know, um, so, so anyway, basically what we have with uh, the cultivation of Chinese herbs over the last, say, 70 years or so is a change from almost no herbs being cultivated to a large amount of herbs being cultivated. The uh, Chinese herb agriculture business in the U, I mean, excuse me, in China is massive. Um, I, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but I, I would, it's, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars if, if it's not in the billions. Um, so there are vast farms that grow, um, especially the, the most popular herbs, things like, um, Huangxi, Astragalus and, uh, Gochizhe, um, Lycian berry, things like that, a uh, 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 um, Angelica sinensis, these, these sort of big ones, there are massive, massive farms that produce those. The smaller ones, there's still 
you know, maybe some fairly large farms, but then also they contract smaller sort of what we will in Chinese, we might translate something like household farmers. Basically it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, small farmers that may have an acre or less of land and um, companies will go and contract people in an area to grow this. Hmm. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the concept of Tao Di is being explored both scientifically and it's being exploited. Um, I would use, I could use that word in the market. Um, and that's because even common everyday, you know, sort of people that don't know anything about Chinese medicine per se will understand or at least have a concept that these are the best herbs. Unfortunately, that is exploited sometimes. They say it's Tao Di when it's not. Um, and it also creates a situation where, you know, if you say that only this is the Dowdy area, but this area is not big enough to supply all the herbs that we need, right. especially in the worldwide market, then that starts to become a problem. Right. So um, taking that concept and, and using it to, to grow uh, herbs in, in the U.S. or anywhere outside of China, I'm not sure that. Yeah, hold it, clo hold it closer. Very, very yeah, the blurring cool. thing is weird. I don't know. Like I have my that's, that's good, perfect. <laughs> so what we can do with this understanding this concept, what we can do because it's so well studied is we have a, a lot of data. And what I mean by that is that we have, um, uh, for example. In the Dowdy region, uh, X number or the range of rainfall is, you know, between this and this many centimeters or inches or whatever. And the number of days of sun and the soil uh, pH and other aspects about soil health are understood. I mean, this is all very well studied. The amount of resources that the Chinese government puts into this kind of research, research is enormous. Um, something that we really are missing in, in, in the West. Um, and so, you know, I tapped into that to do this book. So this book is actually, um, was originally edited by my, um, my advisor, my PhD advisor and a, a woman from my committee. And um, so the reason it was translated is because you know, anybody who's ever done a research graduate degree knows that they have to work, do some kind of work for their, for their advisor. It's often it's teaching. Um, but they didn't really want me to teach. Uh, they wanted me to do something else. And we were trying to figure out what that was. And I saw this book and I, uh, I said, well, that, you know, people might be interested in that. And they, they said, they thought, really, would people want that? I said, yeah, I think, I think they would. And so my advisor said, okay, translate it, basically. I mean, that was, it was pretty quick and easy. And then I thought, oh boy, what have I got myself into, you know, like translating a, a text uh, that has a lot of vocabulary in it that I'm not that familiar with. Um, and so uh, it was, it was, you know, it was quite a job and, uh, but I think I did a pretty good job and and it looks, it looks great. And it, it is the only text available for growing Chinese herbs in the English language that's that's actually, you know, based on what's what's done here. Um, I believe it's the text is going to be increasing in importance in this country. Uh, I I recall that uh, our my my first meeting where I knew I was meeting Thomas Guerin was in, in a in my garden. And, uh, and that was a long time ago. But uh, and, and Thomas came and he he uh, worked in my garden for a while and and did a great job and and uh, I saw his, I saw his the depth of his interest in herbal medicine which was uh, really overwhelming. He was willing to do just about anything to learn more about herbal medicine. True. And as a result, I believe I gifted you my herb course. Yeah, and, and you're only about one of three people I've ever re really given it to. Roy Upton was another one. Hmm. Because I felt that kind of that kind of affinity, I said, "This guy doesn't need to pay for this, and 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 he's he's too busy learning to, to actually afford to buy a course." <laughs> that was also true. <laughs> <laughs> it began a very a very uh, long association 
where uh, he tutored he, he tutored with me and uh, early early days. And I think that uh, that we were I was I'm proud to say that I I think I gave him the start in this direction. So. Uh, the issue yeah, about- I'd, like to, I'd like to add to that, actually. I mean, I think, um, you know, you, you introduced me and we just kind of launched into the uh, topic of Dao D with your question. But um, uh, I think it's really important that viewers of, of this video understand, this interview understand that, um, you know, it's not it's no stretch at all to say that Michael is a primary reason why I am where I am today. Um, there, there's no question whatsoever. I mean, the influence that he and, and Christopher, I have to give Christopher a lot of credit as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Christopher, you know, that's Christopher Hobbs, by the way. Yeah, Christopher Hobbs. Yep. Yeah. So you two were major, major influences on me. Uh, you know, I, of course, I spent, uh, you know, a, a couple of years at the school in Santa Cruz working with you folks, and um, and it wasn't just being at the school and it wasn't just tutoring in the clinic with you and, and going through the whole, you know, getting my acupuncture license. It wasn't just that. It was also like the, uh, the way that I was treated as, um, you know, a student, but somewhat also like on some level, maybe not equal, but a supporter, you know, like I never felt like, we, we, uh, we took you in as, as a colleague right right off the bat. Because... Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I you also, I don't know if you remember this, but you, uh, I think it was after the first or maybe it was the second year as a graduation present, you and Christopher gave me um, uh, King's Dispensatory. Oh, wow. So, uh, which, was, which was a heck of a gift, by the way. A heavy one, too. <laughs> yeah. and uh you know they were just being sort of republished by i think it was the eclectic institute uh which had published a bunch of these eclectic books um and so and and you know that that really that and, and all the other things that i'm talking about really set the stage for me to continue on and with confidence and and knowing that i i could you know, I had, I had tried to tackle these very difficult things with with very little background in in the area, and um, it felt really natural and comfortable to do. And so, as I moved on away from you two, I, I, I never felt like I can't do it. I always felt like I, of course, I can do it. Right. Which you know, maybe it was a little bit ignorant in times, but 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 I've managed to do it. I just kept like forging ahead. And that you did um, because uh, because it, uh, what Thomas went went on to accomplish is something that uh, that I could only look at and, and admire. To me, a, a, a really great student is one who keeps learning and persists. And, and Thomas managed to get himself practicing in his own clinics and and treat, treating people, and then uh, making his way to China because he he wanted to learn, learn more. And and here he is with a PhD from Beijing College. And uh, uh, translating books there, and and, and respected by by uh, Chinese professors in, in China, and he's coming back to the United States soon. This is true. Yes, yes. So uh, my wife and I uh, are moving back uh, later this year. Uh, we'll be based in Western Massachusetts, where we'll be uh, doing a you know we'll be farming and uh, running business there, and uh, teaching and. Um, you know, part of the this work that I've been doing, I've been working with universities doing research on on growing Chinese herbs, and so we're going to continue doing that and working towards bringing uh, you know commercially available volumes to the market. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of my focus at this point. Uh, uh, you know, various uh, doing various teaching and and putting a lot of energy into this this growing thing because I just see that it's a it's an incredibly important aspect of the medicine that's uh, I wouldn't say it's been totally overlooked but it, but it certainly um hasn't had the kind of energy and certainly we haven't been able to bring it to fulfillment uh um so 
It was amazing. And, and I, I think the pandemic showed in a lot of ways the importance of this with supply chain problems. Um, Absolutely. You know, I don't know that we'll be able to grow every herb, but certainly we we can make it so we can grow enough volume of enough herbs that um, even if we were completely cut off, we, we would still have access to a lot of these. Yeah, the United States uh, uh, mostly imports herbs from places like Hungary and Romania. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and sure. there's not, there's, there hasn't been a significant herbal uh, uh, agricultural effort in the United States. But I must say that with the thousands of students who have come through the East-West uh, herb course, uh, almost all of them are, are coming from the place where they're, they're, they're in the garden and they're finding, identifying plants around them. And, and people over and over ask me about growing herbs. And, uh, and Thomas is going to, going to be able to fill that gap uh, in, in this country in, in a beautiful way, because this is re really where uh, a lot of uh, our herbalists are. And, and the, the interest in herbalists is at that level, which I'm happy to say. And uh, there's, there's also a scarcity of Chinese herbs. And so we're going to get from China. So we're going to have to start growing uh, uh, herbs from all, all over the country in, in this country to, to supply this, the growing herb, herb industry here. So Thomas, you're coming exactly the right time. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully the timing is good. Yeah, I think it is. I think yep. it is. We're ready. We're ready. So uh, let's see. I had I had thought about. Oh yeah, uh, plant savers is another another thing that Rosemary Gladstar started in this country because uh, people like in China we, we were mostly wild crafting, which means we go out and plunder plunder the wilderness with the, with the herbs and bring them back and and make our, our potions with them and uh, gradually we were aware of the fact that that uh, this is a limited supply and so <laughs> rosemary came up with uh, with the idea of plant savers which is a, a, a quaint name I, I must say but she's a lovely person and i think the, ter the term fits her nicely and uh and and it's it's made a, a, a quite an impact in terms of promoting people to grow herbs here and, and instead of going out and picking them. So, so there is a, there is a growing need for, for growing herbs in this country. And uh, so is there anything more that we want to say about that right now, Tom, Thomas? Um, um, I, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I just mentioned that, you know, uh, it, it's, we're going to move it forward. And uh, you know, I'm working with with uh, with I, I, like I mentioned universities, but also some growers. And um, you're absolutely correct. And we're not just talking about Chinese herbs here. That uh, you know, the majority of the herbs that are used in this country are actually produced outside of the country. Right. There's some significant farms in the U.S., but it's um, it's a relatively small number and volume compared to the total use. Um, and although some of them, some of that will, will probably never change um, uh, because of growing regions and, you know, availability of land and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and there's also there's also a financial part of it. You know, it's more expensive to grow things in the U.S. than it is other places. Right. Uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to eventually bite the bullet with that one. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. So so we're kind of in a transition period right now. And that's that's one of the biggest hurdles that that, that we're seeing uh, at the moment is that, um, you know, herbs that uh, one of my farmers produces they can't sell at the same price as they even even after being transported across the ocean and dealing with all the duty and so on and so forth of importing uh, products, um, they're still more expensive than. Mm -hmm. And those herbs, you know, when they're produced in the U.S., so that, that's that, that's a challenge um, that we're facing at the moment. So we're trying to trying to find ways to overcome that challenge. Um, part of it's an economy of scale, you know, when you're producing a relatively small amount, then you need more for it than than if you can produce a larger amount. So anyway, that, we'll, we'll resolve that over the, over the coming years. So, so the countries, the United States and China, are have set them up to be kind of rivals in a way on the world stage right now. But uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, uh, why Chinese herbs? 
uh, and, and people still are suspicious of Chinese herbs. You know, I don't want anything from China and stuff. But I tell them that's that's stupid. And and uh, if, right. if you're sick and you had a problem, as far as I'm concerned, I'll take it from wherever, whatever continent it comes from. And right. The Chinese, I certainly the Chinese don't care. You can be sure of that. What? I said certainly the Chinese don't care. You can be certain of that. Right. Uh, they they have a a, a a great love of of herbal medicine, and they've carried their knowledge. Of, about the use of it through thousands of years so that, that's something you can't erase and uh, so we, 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 uh, we know that they, they're, ta- they're getting herbs from different places but I understand they're even growing echinacea now in China uh, that's true uh, a, a large amount of echinacea that is actually used in the US is grown okay. in China so the Chinese know a good herb when they see it no matter where it comes from <laughs> Right. And so um, so I have a colleague that's been doing uh, research on growing and uh, how to grow good echinacea, specifically purpurea, that species. Um, and uh, it's it's really, um, uh, I think, uh, an economic issue more than anything. It's not really used very much in China, certainly not in hospitals and clinics, although some people are beginning to understand it. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that I've it helped people to understand it better. Um, but, you know, uh, one of the things that I think is important for our listeners to understand is that uh, China is a very pragmatic people. And so when they see an herb like echinacea, which has a very large market share of, of, uh, you know, the top 10 or 20 or whatever herbs sold around the world, then they say, oh, well, we should understand that and we should learn to grow that because we can probably sell it. And that's exactly what they've done. So I know for a fact that many, many, many tons of echinacea that is sold in the U.S. on the supplement in the supplement market is cultivated, produced, dried, etc. in China and then exported to the U.S. Really? Which, to me, sounds a little bit bizarre since it's a native plant from the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, should... a bizarre, bizarre thing on my side is uh, is having had uh, uh, at least a couple of students from Hong Kong. Uh, come come to the United States and study with me, and I said, "What are you studying with me for? You're you're in the the capital of herbal medicine in the world." I said, "I want to go there and learn learn what, learn what you got." And, and, and no, they they reassured me over the years that in Hong Kong, uh, the the younger generation just have a fascination with the herbs that grow in the United States because they're something new, just like many of us have a fascination with herbs that grow in India and China and other places initially because it was something exotic and interesting and that we had sure. to, and so the, so there is this all this wonderful thing thing about uh uh how herbs circulate based on people's curiosity also that's yeah. uh, a lot how how we learn about herbs people taste them and some of them die and some of them live <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well thankfully i think we've moved past that uh, stage in our development of understanding herbs. Yeah, but, um, I, I worried about myself. So. <laughs> I, well, I can admit to poisoning myself a few times. <laughs> I'm still here to talk about it, fortunately, but I've certainly um, overdone it a couple of times. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, you know, that, that I think that sort of is a nice segue into, uh, you know, the work that Really, you. I mean, there's a few other people that did some similar work, but but I think your your planetary herbology kind of set the stage for, um, you know, taking the the paradigm of Chinese medical theory, that system, and then taking herbs that you you know you knew and loved basically from your backyard, or at least you know that were more sort of Pacific Northwest, you know? Western, if you want to call it that. But the but the sort of love of the system of Chinese medicine and the love of these plants that you were perhaps more familiar with or understood better or, you know, had more access to um, and sort of marrying those two together. 
Um, and so, um, you know, I think that, I mean, I was, I, I consider myself extremely fortunate to have sort of quite mistakenly stepped right into the middle of that. Um, and, and as I said, carried, carried the ball, I think, a, a farther, much farther down the field, which I, which I respect and, and, and appreciate about you. Yep. Well, I think, you know, you, you, <laughs> you know, there's something to the, uh, the, 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 the person that starts something and, 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 um, you know, sets a foundation for it to happen. That's, that's a different sort of level, if you will, than someone who goes like, Oh, that's cool. Okay. So now I have this foundation. It's already built for me. Now I can build on that, you know? So it's, um, <clears throat> Perhaps, uh, you know, I, I won't say that I, there's nothing innovative about what I did, but I don't know that it was, it could have happened without what you had done prior. And, you know, I, I don't even know if I would have thought of it, to be right. honest. Well, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Well, uh, Chinese medicine is is uh, widely accepted, ever more widely accepted and respected in the United States more than any other system. Ayurveda has come in but uh, they've come in with with certain certain biases that I th think has limited them. They 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 immediately wedded it to yoga, and and uh, and in fact Ayurveda is a branch of of uh, of yoga, uh, one of the one of the several branches. But uh, that that immediately set up a prejudice about vegetarianism and non vegetarianism, and the yogis are. Notorious, notoriously uh, promoting vegetarianism and Chinese will eat anything as long as it, it, it provides some uh, nourishment. And uh, so the uh, the way Ayurveda was first presented in this country in this co country was was a, a way of, of sort of like, if you pardon the expression, save your ass medicine. Where, where they never gave high enough doses to do anything and and everything was done in a very moderate way so that uh, so that you, you didn't really have a whole lot of actual clinical experience with Ayurveda except it, it made people feel better and, uh, and and now I think that gradually that may be changing in Ayurveda but it's a little bit late and Chinese medicine just came in full on was, we're going to treat diseases and, and relieve people's suffering and uh, and that's where that, and they and they and they had the the, the uh, tradition to be able to actually accomplish that here and the respect mm -hmm. for it. And so Ayurveda is still climbing up, but but uh, it's also a great system of healing. Um, yeah, very you know, very cursory, you know, rudimentary one hundred and one kind of Ayurveda. So just really? never went down that path. Yeah. Well, they have a lot of they have a a, a, a great similarity. That that was one of my uh, assumptions, or not assumptions, but one of my observations is that there's a there's a, a similarity of, of traditional people how they relate to herbs in almost in every part of the of the world. Yeah, like, that's the energies of herbs, hot and cold, is common in in in, in most countries and in most traditional systems of herbal medicine. And that was not perhaps all, maybe. I think. And that was not something that was part of uh, part of part of the Western tradition in the in the early part of the 20th century. We, we just take take an herb uh, for for mint for stomach problems or something like that, regardless of the of the constitution of the person. And uh, and, and we know now with with, with a, a deeper understanding of ener herbal energetics that, that herbs don't work that way. These mm. didn't work that well. Um, yeah, these don't work very well that way. Yeah. You, you've done a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, research on, on comparing the herbs from one continent to another. I think you wrote a thesis on, on, on motherwort. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, in, in understanding you, how to use uh, sort of so-called Western herbs, uh, I've sort of started to change that into like, non-Chinese herbs, because basically right. if you're using the Chinese system, then anything that's not part of the Chinese Materia Medica can be, you know, addressed in this way, which is to say to take some, some herb that we want to use clinically um, from 
somewhere else that hasn't already been classified in Chinese medicine and you use the Chinese uh, theoretical construct to understand how to apply that right. plan in a clinical setting. So um, one of the one of the ways that's probably most important and certainly um, I mean so, something that I, I looked at pretty early on and, and now that I have access to the to the Chinese literature because I can read it, I see that it's been done in China forever as far as I can tell pretty much, which is to say that plants in the same genus, for example, right. Um, so, you know, when we think of botanical relationships, there's a, from, you know, very simple, there's a, there's a plant family, and then there's a plant genus, and then there's a species within that exactly. genus. And so uh, if we take a, a, a genus like Leonoris, so that's the motherwort genus, and we look at the species in that genus, and there's, uh, oh, geez, I've forgotten that. I think it's around 20 something. And we say, okay. Um, we all know and love our motherwort from, you know, Europe and, and uh, Western Russia. And uh, we all, if we know Chinese medicine, and we know the uh, motherwort, uh, Yimu Cao, which uh, is from China, or, you know, a lot of Asia, actually. Yeah, its Latin name is Leonora's Cardiaca. I think it's still... That's that's the European Russian version, and then the, it speaks to its effect on the on the cardiovascular system, which is how the Chinese use a lot. Right. Well, <clears throat> so so this is a really interesting. Um, you know, I, I won't go too deep into it because it kind of maybe will take up too much time. But I mean, I spent like several years looking at these two plants, so I could talk about it all day. <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear some of it. And that's what that's what happens when you do a PhD. You learn way more than you should, um, <laughs> and then it's necessary. Um, so um, the the Chinese name for for this uh, so the, the the botanical name is Leonoris japonica, and the Chinese name is Yi Mu Cao. So Yi means uh, boost or to uh, it's like a that formula, that E is like boost the chi kind of thing. So, wow. Huh. Then uh, mu is mother, and tao is herb, a medicinal herb. So it's the medicinal herb or the herb to boost the mother. Wow. So mother I for never, those that's who don't, right. So those who don't know about mother wart, the, the term wart comes from wart which is a Germanic term, which means medicinal plant. Right. So it's the medicinal herb for the mother. So the names are nearly ex nearly the same, right? So that obviously piqued my interest. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so, so, you know, basically when we use these botanical relationships, we, we know that sometimes, but not always, plants from the same genus will tend to have similar actions in a clinical setting. Right. And so if we look at these two plants, they have the same name, basically, like almost exactly the same name. So that's, that's like a pretty good clue that they're used the same. And so I started investigating the literature. And what I found which was extraordinarily, I mean, I think one of the things that I found that was probably the most interesting, and I did a lot of, I did chemistry, I did uh, historical uh, um, uh, research, looking at all the texts I could find for both species. Um, and then I also uh, did some genetics to look at their, how they were uh, uh, related genetically. So I won't really talk about the genetics because it's not that interesting, to be honest. <laughs> Um, It'd be uh, my head also, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'll probably lose half of the, you know, at least half of the, you know, listeners anyway. So um, then, if we look at the, um, if we look at the uh, the literature, one of the things that I found that was that was most interesting about um, Yimu Cao, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, species, is that. Um, until the Qing dynasty, so only a couple hundred years ago, it was almost exclusively, and 
basically we can say exclusively 99.999% of the time it was used uh, only for postpartum diseases. Wow. It was not used for menstrual diseases. Really? There's almost no mention of anything like that uh, prior to the Qing dynasty. So what would be postpartum diseases as a sample of that? So uh, excessive bleeding is a big one. Uh, other types of other types of uh, uh, symptoms like um, dizziness, um, seeing ghosts. Um, really? Uh, 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 muddled thinking, anxiety, swelling. Hmm. Those types of, you know, postpartum disease. I mean, you have to consider that uh, postpartum health was not the same 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago as right. it is today. Um, and, and so I found that to be extraordinarily interesting because starting in about the mid Qing dynasty and on, it's discussed frequently, if not always, as a, an herb used to treat menstrual disorders. But it's not really in too many of the formulas. Uh, and so because a lot of the formulas we use in Chinese medicine are older than that. Yeah, I I I'm, 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 I'm noticed that. Uh -huh. Right, so it's not really in most of those formulas, even though everyone thinks of it for that. But interestingly, another interesting thing is that in China, pretty much every woman in the country, no matter where you have your child, if you have it in any hospital in the country, which most people do, or if you have a midwife, which would only happen in the countryside these days, um, they all are given motherwork after they have um, almost every single person, so every they, woman who's ever had a child. If you ask, they have the baby. They're, they they're, they're all given mother ward. Yep. Right. Clean the clean the battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, give me well, uh, conversely, <laughs> conversely, conversely, uh, 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 the Western mother ward, Leonora's cardiaca. Right always discussed for these problems always like th th through the entire literature but also for these other the reason it's called cardiaca and previously previous to being being you know put in this leonoris genus it was actually called cardiaca right. so it was well known for use for anxiety and insomnia and, and these types of diseases huh. um so uh but it's always also been discussed for uh women's health for you know, in a broader sense, which which obviously includes uh, menstrual diseases. Um, so the so uh, that that difference I saw as as pretty important. The next thing I discovered was that um, in the cases in postpartum diseases where there were some kind of what we might call mental emotional problems the doctors or the prescriptions always included using the herb either fresh as a juice or processed with alcohol in almost every single case. Really? So that means that they were getting something either from the fresh juice or the alcohol preparation that they couldn't get from a decoction. Hmm. And so then I started exploring what that could be. And it turns out that in the chemistry, the uh, uh, the Chinese species there's there's two primary alkaloids found in the uh, Western species, and only one of those is present in the Chinese species, and that is uh, it's water soluble, but it's more soluble in alcohol, nice. and so you use alcohol, you get more of that compound and you also get more of some other compounds that are important for producing this calming action that Leonoris has. And so those, those flavonoids are more soluble in alcohol than they are in water. And when you uh, process, either use the fresh juice or you process the herb in alcohol, and you get a more of a calming action. And so the Chinese recognized that 
though they, they didn't think about the chemistry, of course, they didn't know about the chemistry, but they knew that it was a different product. And that talks about, you know, the Pauger aspect and all these different ways that they produce. Um, yeah, Pauger is, is the method that the Chinese use, which are many, of processing herbs to bring out certain properties. Uh, right. Herbs that uh, make them more prominent. Right. So for those who are, aren't really familiar with Pauger, just very, very briefly, um, there's a there's a long list of processing techniques that happen to the dried herb. Um, for example, it might be soaked in alcohol and then and then um, heated to dry it, um, and then that herb is is um, decocted. And so what that does, it actually frees up some of the um, constituents that are more alcohol soluble or, or only alcohol soluble. Right. Um, part of the decoction. That's just one small example. There's a there's a lot. And it's been uh, my it's been my thesis that, uh, or my my belief my belief in that basically, Western herbalism has, has mainly gotten to the place where they where everything goes into alcohol or water, and uh, and and both of those things you know, when people throw the mark, which is the stuff that you that's left at the end, they throw it away. A lot of us ask, well, what what is that good for? You know. <laughs> and indeed, right. in, indeed, the the Chinese and and, and India both uh, have way, ways of bringing out certain qualities in the herbs by how it's how it's processed that we haven't even begun to explore. And now, with bringing into China, bringing Chinese medicine into the West, there's the opportunity of 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 of, uh, of actually exper experiencing processing Western herbs to see what we can do to change the properties and alter the properties which I think is right. fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've experimented with some of that. I talk about it in, in, in my books, um, but it's pretty, pretty rudimentary. Just, you know, I just, it's time and energy to do all these things. And I, I know, I know. I'm, I'm actually working on a, on a powder book because there's not really a good powder book in English, not that covers how to really do it. Yeah, I got, and, I got the only one I think there is. And... That's, that's what we got. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, that's another thing. Just like, uh, just like the Tao Di literature, it's a there's a vast, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I think one of the blessings of coming to China is that I've been able to um, really immerse myself in the not just the culture, but uh, the language and. Um, and having access to the language now allows me to sort of read all this stuff that we don't have in English. And, and, and we'll never, I mean, a lot of it will never be translated just because it's just a time and energy thing. I mean, there's thousands of volumes, you know, so. Right. And, and, uh, and anyway, so yeah, just like, I, I know we're getting close to time there, but the, so Leonor's is just a, is an example of how we can use botanical relationships to understand how to use, uh, you know, uh, quote unquote, Western herbs in Chinese medicine. Um, you know, other examples, maybe a hawthorn, um, legusticum. Uh, so, uh, you know, a hawthorn, uh, critagus, there's, you know, a bunch of species in North America and, and in Europe that have, you know, history of use, as well as China. So, um, and then legusticum, you know, one of those ones that's most famous is OSHA, but also, um, Lovage. Now, Lovage is in a weird place botanically, but it's similar. And actually, Lovage is, um, you know, of course, has a very long history of use in in the West. I mean, it's in the Bible, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Um, and and it's also grown here, and it's used as a substitute for for Dangui, uh, Angelica sinensis. Mm -hmm. Though though not considered to be the same, it is used as a sub as a cheaper substitute. I got one burning question that, that I, I specifically wanted to ask you, sure. because uh, as you and I know, uh, the Chinese recognize thousands and thousands of herbs, and and, mm -hmm. and many, most of which uh, we don't even know about in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet, when we look at Chinese materia medicas in this country, they're they're sort of like a set thing. Every book has the same group of herbs, usually in each category. How did, how did that ever get decided? Uh, well, I, 
I don't know that it really would cause quote unquote decided so much as um, I mean, if we go back, if we look at the the history of the sort of development of Chinese medicine, um, if we look at the Materia Medica history, we see it starts with the Shenlong Ben Cao Jing, uh, which is about 1800 years ago or something like that, like similar time frame as the treaties uh, on cold damage or the Shang Han Lun. Um, and so, um, and from that period, so that was 365 herbs. And then that was expanded over time. <clears throat> but the, uh, because of the way that Chinese medicine developed around uh, using formulas clinically uh, and in pharmacies, and there was certainly some government influence. I mean, in the Song Dynasty, there was all this about a thousand years ago, there was all this influence to try to, quote unquote, at the time, modernize uh, uh, medicine, um, which was, of course, Chinese medicine. They didn't call it that. But anyway, um, and it was about creating these sort of patent formulas or, you know, they're, sometimes they're called imperial formulas. It just means that it was in the formulary that was sponsored by the government. Um, and uh, yeah, we call so, it the imperial formulary, or, uh, the imperial formulary of Chinese medicine, but it ignores the thousands of other herbs that are that are also used by in, locally in different areas of China. Right, and I, I wouldn't say it ignored him so much. Is it? It was a pragmatic approach. Uh, you know, some herbs came from all all over the country. Right. Uh, you know, herbs came from all over the country. <laughs> And in some places they were used as, you know, as tribute. I mean, uh, some herbs were considered valuable and that was required tribute from this area or that area to be, you know, the tax man comes and they take it away. You have to give that to them. So, um, you know, how those decisions were made is, is maybe a lot more um, than we could get into in, a, in an interview like this. But um you know, some of it was based on the formula. So here's the formula. These are the herbs that are in these formulas. Yeah. Right. Um, but then, you know, like, so then, but there, there's literally thousands and thousands of formulas. I mean, I have, I have texts from the Song and then the Ming dynasty. I mean, the, the, the Puji Feng, which is uh, this, you know, very famous Ming dynasty uh, formulary is, what is it? Tw I think 12 volumes. I mean, it takes up almost a whole shelf on my, on my bookshelf. Um, and, 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 that, and that's in Chinese. And I just want people to try to understand that Chinese is a lot more economic as far as like how many, how much space it takes up to say the same thing. So if, if I were to take the next like decade, say, and translate all that material, it would be like a whole bookshelf, you know? Um, so the, the volumes, but on the other hand, if you look at those formulas, it's, it's really... The number of herbs is still fairly limited compared to what you're talking about, the, you know, 5,000 herbs or whatever that are, it's more than that. It's more like 15,000 herbs that are known to have medicinal use and are used locally. Um, another, another of my, uh, I, I won't say student, but I think I, I think I introduced him to Chinese medicine with Subhuti Dharmananda, who is a brilliant scientist and, uh, and, he never got a license in Chinese medicine, but he's he's a, he's a scientist and with the, a, the, the in the best possible sense. And when he got interested in herbs, and he also edited my first book, The Way of Herbs, which is which was a, a great boon. <laughs> he was fantastic. But uh, he, when he, when he decided to actually write a course on Chinese medicine, he structured the course around studying the the herbs in the formulas. Which I which I still think is is one of the best ways to, to learn the Chinese materia materia medica, learn the formulas and then learn the herbs in the formula. Hmm. And and, and uh, I I don't know if they they do that in China, but I, I think it was a, a great thing that uh, Sabuti stumbled on when he when he created that that approach to learning Chinese medicine many 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 years ago, of course. Yeah. Well, listen, I think I think uh, we've we've uh, whetted people's appetite about. Uh, the possibility of what they can learn about using herbs, Western herbs in the in the Chinese um, uh, way, so that you can be more accurate and achieve uh, more accurate results. 
and uh, also the uh, the possibilities of gr growing herbs uh, uh, something that the east west herb course has been very deficient in. we haven't put a bit a big emphasis on it because we've been waiting for somebody like thomas to come along uh, we want to we want to have we want to have the best in that department uh, and uh, he is in, in my opinion the best we teach we have a you know we have the learning garden and we teach um mostly kids from schools, local schools. What do you, what um, do you teach about, uh, about uh, growing things? Yeah, we, I teach about, um, I, I try to um, help them to understand the connections uh, between them, the plants and the soil, basically like Wonderful. my my version of ecology uh, for, for, you know, for little kids and the importance of, you know, composting and, just, I mean, they're city kids mostly, so they don't, you know, they don't really know too much. And I, I can pull the microscope out after we've talked about, you know, the importance of these little organisms that you can't see in the soil and get them to take soil samples and then put them under the microscope and they can see all these little critters running around in the microscope, which is really fun. It is. Do, uh, they, do they really have an effective treatment for prostate, in large prostate? I, I, you know, Salpa Meadow is uh, it's, it's very feeble as far as I'm concerned. Maybe, maybe in the early stages it might help a bit, but, that, but that's about it. Uh, David Winston takes some, some exception when I say that, but but that's been my experience with him giving it to men as well. So right, well, I, I think I, you know, I I think you can you can also keep in mind that not everything works for everybody. Right? Yeah. And, and uh, so I think that, yes, I, especially in the early stages, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty well treated. Um, and it depends on, you know, the presentation and the path. I, I had a difficult time and I still, still struggle with trying to understand the energetics of, of, uh, of, of uh, salt palmetto. <laughs> Whether, you know, yeah. Young yeah, to be honest, that's not an herb that I really ever used very much. I know. So I don't really, um, it's not in any of my books. They have and, a uh, nourishing property in terms of enlarging women's breasts. So that would that would speak of, of putting into a yin category. Uh, but then uh, the idea of frequent urination uh, possibly would be more of a yang category. And, or maybe an astringent category. Pardon? Maybe an astringent category. It might. Yeah. I don't know. I think it maybe. Um, you know, I've always kind of thought like sort of it's like a like a cornice sort of thing. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Not exactly the same, but in that sort of like area where it's it's nourishing, but it's also astringent. Um, you know that that would. That would make the most sense to me, but without really having used it too much or even really investigated it that much, to be honest, I don't know why it's it never just, yeah, I don't know why. It's one of those herbs that just kind of like always, I kind of always went, man. Yeah, I've I tended to do it, avoid it or, or put it into a product just because it, it, it it's a selling point, but then I put out the other herbs that I think are really doing things in it with it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one, one, one really clear, first of all, Dweyel was something that that I kind of like use a lot in in my, in my formulations uh, without necessarily even thinking about it. And mostly I use I use the synergistic aspect of it, but I know there's others other aspects sure. of Dweyel. But uh, the notion that you have two herbs that that, sent, that are known for doing the same thing, same main thing, but you, but each one brings another dimension in terms of treatment and. And and possibly counteracts some of the bad effects of, of, of each other, so right, that, yeah. that, that's the synergistic approach. But I have one beautiful case. It happened when I was living in uh, uh, first started my clinic in, in near Dominican Hospital here. A guy came in with an infection. It was a typical uh, situation. I give I give echinacea for infections, and in three or four days, it's usually better. But this guy did not respond to it. And he came in two or three weeks in a row. And I decided he, he, he had chi deficiency. And I just added like a quarter part of ginseng to the e echinacea and immediately it clicked. And uh, 
that 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 I tell that story over and over again because that, that just shows how the herbs can can complement and 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 enhance each other's uh, effects and so forth. And uh, so so I think Dui Duyal is really important. And I think that, that a lot of uh, there's there's a number of Chinese doctors who don't actually relate to the classical formulas that much. They just build up formulas based on Duyal. And uh, a guy named Kenneth Pang, who was a teacher of uh, Ken, Ken Smith, who was one of the first acupuncturists in Santa Cruz, actually, um, along with myself, myself and, and Martha Benedict came afterwards. And uh, anyway, he studied with Kenneth Pang, and Kenneth Pang didn't, didn't, as far as I could tell, used use traditional formulas. He used he he, he put together herbs based on on Duyel, uh, and, and matching the. the, the patient's symptoms with that. So um, it'd be very interesting to see how that can be done with, with Western herbs. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. One of the things that I've, I've learned by studying the, the older texts, you know, the, the Western texts, um, is that they, uh, you know, even the eclectics pretty regularly say like, oh, it works better when you give it with this. Or treating, you know, it treats this, 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 and this, but for treating that, add this herb to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's that's it is, it's just not emphasized. Right. So it's it's in the texts, it just hasn't been emphasized. And so <clears throat> I think that's one of the things that I want to explore more. Um, I'm I'm digitizing all these texts, um, making them searchable. Uh, that's a project I've been doing, you know, I've actually hired some people to help me with that. And um, so we're taking all these Chinese and Western texts and, uh, you know, because you can go on and say archive.org or these other sites and you can download them, but they're just photograph, you know, they're just picture PDFs. So right. you can't search them. And I know uh, Henriette Kress has done her thing and, um, which was really built on what Michael Moore did originally in the nineties. And, um, and so I've kind of, I've, I've sort of done the same thing more or less, but I also have done a lot of Chinese texts. Um, and, and what that allows me to do is to investigate, you know, these kinds of questions like, okay, so, uh, black cohosh, how did the eclectic, <laughs> What did the eclectics do with that herb? Right. And, and, and what other herbs did they use it with? And you'll find that actually they mention combinations pretty regularly with that. I know black cohosh and blue co co cohosh almost all, always almost always get used together. Right. So so I mean I think it's it's I think it just it was one of those things that was done. It wasn't really emphasized very much, and it wasn't it sort of stopped developing, I mean, because what happened in the 20s, right? I mean, herbal medicine basically got cut off at the knees. And so anything that was developed in the first couple hundred years in U.S. Uh, herbal medicine sort of almost completely ended right. until the 60s, really. I mean, there was very little between the 20s and the 60s, yep. almost none. Almost none I, was right? there, I, was, I was there with the when the last herbal pharmacy in the country and. Uh, on Ellis Street in San Francisco closed and uh, um, and, and he, he he basically uh, uh, just saw the whole thing kind of dwindle down to, to that to that one thing to, to, to one one pharmacy and that was in San Francisco and I, I became friends with this guy as you know uh, the Germans were uh, were very very big on health and, and herbal medicine and they 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 cultivated echinacea throughout throughout the the, the 30s when when it was com completely forgotten in this country and then they realized that they they didn't have the angustifolia they they were growing purpurea <laughs> after about 10 years of growing it and and uh, so that herb was was the most popular herb and used for infections used just like antibiotics was uh, mm -hmm. across the board before before uh, and, and when antibiotics came in people switched over because it was something new it was it was scientific 
pharmaceutical and the curiosity just kind of led them down this other other road and uh and echinacea got completely forgotten and uh basically it, it, it was sort of like a little a little one word amongst 30 or 40 herbs that were used for for infectious diseases in in, in uh, back to eden yeah yeah and I and I hit on that word, and I for some reason because it was just it was so weird. <laughs> that was the only reason. And I went and I I, I traveled from Black Bear to go down and, and visit uh, Nathan Potters, who was this racist <laughs> German German who was herbalist who ran the pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow or another, we became friends, <laughs> and I was this you know hippie with a with a. A, a, a deer skin vest that I tanned and a knife at my side and walking in there with my long hair and beard and everything. And, and it was like the meeting, <laughs> the meeting of two continents and two, two galaxies, but, but <laughs> we met over herbs. And I asked him, I said, about what about echinacea? He says, Oh, that herb he says, nobody ever asked for that anymore. He says, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go down. I'll, I'll, I'll go down and see if I have any in the basement. I'll just give it to you. So he gave me uh, the last eight ounces of herbs that was in in the basement, and I didn't have any idea how to use it. And I brought it back up to Black Bear because staph infections was a big deal living living at Black Bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and, and and the golden seal was was used like candy practically in in Haight Ashbury. That was the herb that, that the hippies picked up on and after cannabis, and uh, and it and it wasn't very effective for for uh, for staph infections. I be quite frank with you. So I I decided how am I going to take this eight herbs like like Christ and the loaves and fishes and multiply it so it could it could go the longest way possible. So I developed the idea of make, making it an alcoholic extract out of it and giving small doses four three or four 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 times a day and regularly every couple of hours and just to keep it in the blood, and that became. Ad adapted as the way to use echinacea by a lot of people afterwards but but it, it, it worked it worked like magic and it, it was every, every case of of uh of staph infection that, that occurred went away and and uh i've, I've had people um uh, sometimes like when i was in hawaii uh, a woman i was i was try trying to learn how to surf <laughs> And I was I was uh, doing it with this young young woman who was doing a much better job. I mean, she was like nineteen or twenty or something. And her mother said, when her, heard that I was Michael Tierra, and she came over and just gave me a big hug. She said she read she read the Way of Herbs and and Echinacea, and her her daughter was born with a with a brain defect, a hole in her brain, which meant that she had to be on on uh, antibiotics all the time. And her mother couldn't couldn't do that, so she just of her own just decided to use echinacea instead. And she never needed to go back to the doctor with it. And she said, "There's my daughter serving surgery with you, <laughs> perfect." <laughs> so I mean, you know, another guy had had running staff run, running a, a, a infection on his leg that was they want they were going to amputate his foot, and he wrote to me from uh, the other from the. Uh, southeastern part of the United States has talked about using echinacea in that way and it saved his foot. So, mm. I, so I, I think a, a lot of herbalists, even, even to this day, it, it's gotten short shifted with the idea that if you use it for colds, I think it's a very feeble herb for colds, in my opinion, mm. and, and for flus. I, I, I know it has antiviral and, and maybe antibacterial, most, mostly antibacterial, I think. But its its effects are are, are uh, and it ha it has a totally unique way of of treating infections by walling off the area where the infection is occurring, so that the uh, enzymes would not break down the tissues and, and proliferate. And so the so basically the the disease is it just stops right where where it's at when you take enough echinacea. That's what causes it to do that, mm. and, and so. Then the echinacea revival, top one of the top selling herbs in the country. So, so you know, my my path in herbal medicine, which I which I also honor, as I know you do yours, was very was very different from yours. I think when you started out, you were you, I I felt kinship because I felt like you started out 
in your in your way from where I was when when I started out, just grappling mm-hmm. grappling whatever I could from wherever I could find it. Right. And then, yeah. then you decided to uh, to get a more systematic uh, way of go, going at it, and, you, and 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 now you're an incredible scholar, and 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 uh, and it's, it, it, uh, hooray! <laughs> I still like to get my hands dirty, huh? I still like to get my hands dirty. So I think I think that's what you know. I, one of my um, so this uh, woman who uh, was on my committee for my PhD and is is the um, is one of the original editors of this uh, cultivation book, and really the person who I worked with the most, to be honest, more than my advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she she really. She often talks about me uh, as an example of someone who really gets it because not only am I, can I like go to the lab and do that work, but then I can actually go to the farm and do the work there too. Yeah. And um, it's funny, I didn't, I didn't really realize she was doing this until one of my classmates, um, someone in a different you know, a different advisor than me, but at the same level as me, right. was at a conference that she was speaking at that I wasn't at. And she put a slide up of a photograph of me and went on for about five minutes about how more scientists need to understand that the, the doing part is important, not just like the theoretical and the laboratory. Oh, absolutely. Work really understand what the farmers and various people are have to go through to do these things informs your science and so they're you know they're incredibly important to keep connected because a lot of people they don't you know they they go through school and just sort of like they get on it's it's funny you see these people that are that are that are uh researching various aspects of plants but have no connection to the plant whatsoever they have no connection to where it comes from they don't know anything more about the plant than what their research area is exactly that's mind-boggling to me like i one time asked i wanted to get some seeds of this plant from this woman who had been working on this plant i I knew like she had already completed her phd and she was doing postdoc And she was working on the same plant. And so I started asking her some questions about it and where I could get seeds. Because she had, I knew she had some seeds. So I started asking some other questions about growing it. She had no idea. No idea. Zero. I don't know that she, uh, maybe she could have identified (laughs) it. She had seen it growing, maybe. But but not necessarily. Because she's doing, I mean, you know, in, in her, you know, give her some credit she's doing really high level uh chemistry but uh to not have a further connection to it is is weird to me like i just can't imagine uh doing that kind of work and working with that plant at that level for that long and not know basically everything there is to know about the plant (laughs) well yeah actually uh you know so one of the things that I, i thought of you know and decided was really important before before you contacted me about the course was that um you know teaching a lot of people say like oh you, you know you can you can teach this or that ceu course and i'm like yeah okay i can yes and i will but that's not really what my focus is and there's a couple of reasons for that um one is that it's a very small audience. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, from a financial point of view, it's not necessarily a wise choice. Right. And there's a much wider audience of these kind of like we're calling them hobby herbalists. And so from a financial point of view, it makes a lot more sense to focus on that audience. Definitely. Uh, and and also uh, I think I think you will relate to this as well, which is to say that I, I want to empower people. I want people to be able to take care of themselves. Right. I want 
Um, I mean, sh surely if people want to go beyond just sort of like being a, a, a kitchen herbalist or a hobby herbalist, or just taking care of their friends and family, I'm happy to mentor them and work with them. Um, but I'm, I think my primary interest at this point, outside of my sort of academic scholarly uh, interests, which are really just a lot of mental masturbation, which I, I enjoy. Um, I mean, who doesn't like to jerk off occasionally, right? right. So, um, but, but my primary focus is really on these, this group of, uh, of folks to create, uh, or to empower this group of people, because I, I have a really strong sense that this, this empowerment has been essentially taken away, stolen by a, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, and, and all the things that sort of like the mechanism that's built up around that uh, in the country and, and, you know, in a lot of places in the world, most places in the world. Um, and I think a lot of people want that. They want to be empowered. They want to find ways to be independent of the system, for lack of a better word. Right. Um, the system also, I, I think, includes the 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 TCM group, that's also a system. And, and the language that's used is, uh, tends, to, tends to, to separate people because, because they don't feel like they have an entrance into it. The, the jargon that's used and the, the language that's used in each, each of these systems uh, uh, is, 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 is a, is, keeps people separate. And I and I keep thinking that I'm a culpeper herbalist, and and from what you're describing right now, you're a culpeper herbalist also. Basically, basically taking the the, the texts that people uh, spend years like like talking about theoretical points and what maybe one herb, while 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 people down the street could not afford that herb or any herbs, and were not being served. So he took right. these these texts that they were arguing with that were all, all in Latin and Greek. That was how they protected their profession, and he translated it into English. And yeah, uh, and that, that 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 was a, a a big historical thing. And and uh, next to the Bible, I think it was it's the most published book, uh, in two editions over over the ages. Right, years. and so I, I would agree on that sense of like a Culpeper herbalist. I, I don't think I've ever thought of that per se. <laughs> but, um, um, I think that, I mean, to your point about sort of Chinese medicine, one of the things that I don't think is really avoidable is that, um, you know, Chinese medicine comes out of a different culture. Uh, the, the, the um, you can't, uh, I, I would strongly oppose um, watering down the language to fit modern Westerners so that they saw the words and go, oh, I know what that means. Um, I just don't think you can do that and, and preserve the medicine. I really don't. Um, so there is a language that you need to learn. And I don't, I don't mean you, you need to learn Chinese per se, but but there is a vocabulary that you need to learn. And that's true of any, you know, certainly when you first started, you know, uh, studying herbal medicine, you didn't really know what, uh, an, I mean, even anti-inflammatory, maybe you had some vague concept of it, but you didn't really know what it meant. And so I, I think that, I think that if you, if a person really wants to study Chinese medicine, then they do need to learn that vocabulary. Simple as that. You can. You don't necessarily need to learn the 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 Wiseman and Yeah dictionary. You don't need to learn all those to be able to you know take care of your family with some with a very sort of rudimentary uh, understanding of Chinese medicine. I think that's that's reasonable. But if you want to take it beyond that, then then you you just have to um, really see how you can get around that. Well, um, I mean, just as an example. Uh... Even even ragweed, which I've had a lot of personal uh, use of lately, I wrote a blog on on using ragweed for coughs uh, because, uh, of course, 
you know, it's it's popularly used for hay fever and things like that. But 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 I had this cough that lingered, and was happening happening because there was a post nasal discharge going in my throat, it caused mm -hmm. me to cough, and still have, have a little bit of it. And I I take a little bit of uh, ragweed tincture, <laughs> you know, 15, mm -hmm. 15, 30 drops, and I'd have relief for a few hours afterwards. And okay. and uh, now, if if I were to take a, a drug like Mucinex, uh, or or uh, one of the other one of the other drugs that's used for colds and flus and, and hay fever, they're called antihistamines. As far as I'm concerned, okay. uh, ragweed is an antihistamine. I would agree. So so the, there there is a trans the, there there the, that that makes it immediately. Uh, understood across the board in terms of uh, not not, not if, if you were to try to describe it in, as wind external wind, wind cold or something like that it, it would not relate uh, to but if i say it open, opens the nasal passages which is which is very common way to to and even in, in in professional texts in chinese medicine yeah, yeah. then you would understand yeah you does. know but so i think i think there's i think there's uh, some overlap in the way that uh, I mean a lot of a lot of Chinese medicine um, states things really very clear and simply then there's like this whole milieu of within, you know, within that system is theory behind within, that within that system it's clear and simple but if you take that system and put it into a, a, a to totally different culture like 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 in the West it's not that clear and simple uh, Right, but ask 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 a, you know a hundred people on the street what an antihistamine is. You might be surprised that most people can't tell you. No, but doctors would understand it. Doctors would understand it, sure. That's that's they studied it, just like doctors of Chinese medicine would understand if you said uh, you know wind, heat, blah blah blah. Right, and that's, so a, that's, that's a big hurdle. Professional language, right? That's a big hurdle. The other, the other burning question that that I never really got a, gotten a, a satisfactory answer about, uh, besides how the how the imperial materia medica was was developed, is how how did how did the Chinese actually understand uh, organ systems? Certainly, certainly in their descriptions, as as they're used in Chinese medicine, these are not physiologically and anatomically correct as they stand. Uh, in terms of modern modern physiology and mo modern anatomy, and uh, so while the, the the importance of the kidneys, as an example, or the, or the importance of the spleen in Chinese medicine, you know, in, in Western herbal medicine, the spleen is 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 a is a removable organ, <laughs> you know, right. Uh, how 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 do, how do they actually decide that there's, there's only going to be like a, 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 a limited number of organs, twelve of them or whatever, uh, and how do they know about that? And and okay, would it be good to clear that up? Well, to answer that question, uh, without you know going on too too deeply, um, first of all, the Chinese did. Do um, were aware of physical anatomy for sure. There's no question about that. There are drawings that are pretty early that show that they clearly knew what was inside the body and the basic shapes of those. Right. Um, so they they absolutely did understand the physical anatomy. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the problems that I see in your question and is a very common uh, problem with this issue um, that, you know, I mean, I've, I've been asked by like doctors to like, clearly in Chinese medicine, they don't understand what the spleen is. And I was like, well, here's the, here's the thing. That's a, that's a translation issue more than anything. That's what because I was in Chinese medicine. We don't, I mean, in Chinese, we don't say spleen. We say P. Exactly. Which is translated as spleen. So who made that 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 translation? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't. I've never looked that, to see that, that's where the problem was. Right. If we call, so, it, 
call a kidney, if we call a kidney shin, or we call it spleen P, I can say, okay, yes, that's that, that's what that that's what they're talking about. Right. So, but that shen is not the same shen as like the spirit shen. It's a different character. No, I, I know. Not related at all. I know. So, um, mm, so the other thing is that uh, the way that Chinese medicine developed, and because of um, essentially like philosophical thought in the East, there's always a connection. Nothing is taken as this separate thing that acts alone. Right. It actually doesn't exist. That's just not the way that people think here. Right. Right. So everything with everything, there's always context and relationships between that thing and everything else, because you can't separate it out. So in the case of, for example, the spleen, quote unquote spleen, um, there's, I think it's without question includes also the pancreas uh, and functions of the small intestine and perhaps even the stomach right. to a lesser extent, but perhaps even the stomach. Absolutely. So if you, the, if you took the digestive functions of to some extent, the stomach, the small intestine, the pancreas, and sure the spleen put that in there too. Um, then you have a, a much more closer understanding of what is meant by uh, what we call, you know, spleen in English in Chinese medicine. But whoever whoever decided to translate that as as spleen, because that, that that's that's a mistake. But I don't see any any attempt in in Chinese medical circles to actually correct those kinds of errors. Mm, I think that's one that's just it's so embedded and people uh, should understand that it's a systematic concept, not an individual organ concept. Um, a better word that certainly there were there could have been a better word choice chosen, but I don't know what it would be. I think early on for quite a while people tried to say spleen pancreas I mean, that that's maybe and I, I, I got criticized over and over by Orthodox Chinese calling it spleen pancreas or kidney adrenal. Right. Right. So that's, you know, it's also a little bit clunky and, you know. Clunky, but it, uh, at least it says that it does more than what the, just the spleen does. Sure, sure. Um, I guess I, I usually explain to people that it's a system, not an organ. So it's the spleen system. It's the, you know, kidney system, which is to say that it's not just what that physical organ does, but because, um, you know, when these concepts were developed, I mean, you have to, <laughs> you have to give, give them a little credit. I mean, this stuff was first written down. I mean, that, you know, the earliest stuff we have is, is over 2000 years. Um, and the, the concepts were developed before that, um, I mean, even even if you want to look at some of the old Greek stuff from around the same period, their concepts of how those organs worked were, you know, pretty comical compared to what we understand now, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think that that's often sort of overlooked. Like, okay, yeah, I think the system is broken. Take a two thousand year old description of an organ and slap on, you know, today's understanding of the of the anatomy and physiology of that herb and say, well, it's not the same. Well, of course it's not the same, you know, it, 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 and it's also not, uh, not really relevant. Like it doesn't even matter that it's not the same. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like who cares? There are two different matter to us because we know, but, it, but it does matter when you're trying to talk to people who are more Western medical oriented. It matters. Uh, right. So, so then you, so, I mean, uh, unfortunately, yeah, the onus is on us. A long conversation. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, the onus is on us to try to use terminology that they understand to explain it rather than using Chinese medicine terminology because they don't understand that. And it's useless. Well, anyway, it's like, like, like all these other things that I think that are going to evolve. I think that's going to evolve also. Uh, Chinese medicine will evolve and change as it, as it becomes more 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 uh, understood and appreciated in the west it just is inevitable and and, uh, and and i think we should be prepared for that and 
maybe even help it help it along so it, it goes in the directions that we want it to go. Uh, maybe something will be lost, but maybe something will be gained also. And yeah. Well, one of the things about Chinese medicine uh, that you can be sure of that it will change because it always has changed. It's always evolved. Um, but the other thing is that it's all it's hung on to, or at least maintained to some extent, all of its sort of original ideas. It's wonderful. Uh, one of the one of the beauties I think um, that goes underappreciated by a lot of people is that. Chinese medicine has, you know, until the very most modern era, been pretty comfortable with the fact that different sort of schools of thought saw things differently. I mean, there certainly were arguments and, you know, my system's better than your system. My family lineage is, lineage is better than yours. I mean, that's just pretty human stuff, right? But, but, um, but at the same time, you know, there were no wars started over it or whatever. There was, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, okay. So that's the way you... They had their share of wars for sure. <laughs> but not over, not, not over that. You know, that's what I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the, one of the things that, that Paul Unschel really, really point, pointed out very strongly to me when I read it is uh, the effect of of uh, politics on, on Chinese, on, on medicine, uh, that medicine always reflects the politics of the country and uh, and, and that, that, that wow. I found that to be really fascinating thank you all so right much. great all right bye-bye have bye. a good dinner <laughs>